Coming to you from Brentwood, Los Angeles, California, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. Today I'm sitting down with Lisa C., the author of many novels, the most recent ones of which, A Snowflower and Secret Fan, Peony in Love, Shanghai Girls, Dreams of Joy, have, how do I put it, have connected different eras of history, but all with the through line of women connected to China, whether they're in China from China, from a Chinese heritage, or any combination thereof. Her new book is China Dolls, which continues it continues this project, but it heavily involves... It's, it's a novel of California. It heavily involves both the Chinatowns of San Francisco and Los Angeles, California's two most famous Chinatowns. Lisa, tell me, what are the... What's an important difference or two between these two Chinatowns? Well, obviously, the uh, San Francisco Chinatown is our original mm-hmm. Chinatown in the United States. Um, it, you know, of course, burned to the ground in, in 1906 and was rebuilt. And so it really, from the beginning, really the first one to be built in a kind of conscien- conscientious, uh, deliberate way right there in the center of the city. It really makes it quite unique. Um, San Francisco Chinatown is also where they had the first Chinese American nightclubs, which is, of course is what China Dolls is about. Los Angeles Chinatown uh, has moved so many times, and there have been different iterations of it. So you had the original Chinatown, which is where Union Station is today. You had the, what was called the Market Chinatown, You have, uh, which was by City Market, the Produce Market. There was China City, the tourist attraction, New Chinatown, now called Old Chinatown. Um, now we have also the whole entire San Gabriel Valley. So is that a Chinatown or is that just a series of cities that happen to have very large Chinese populations? So they're, they're very different in um, how, how they evolved, but also how they look. What got you interested in what was going on in the, in the, in the Chinese nightclubs of, of these, of, dur- during wartime in America, I'll put it that way broadly. What, what got you fascinated in those places in that period? I think there were two things. <laughs> One is kind of just a selfish thing, which is uh, my, la- my previous book, Dreams of Joy, uh, took place during the Great Leap Forward. And that was a very dark period, you know, and I spent two years um, doing research and writing and interviewing people who had survived the Great Leap Forward. And, you know, it's a period where 45 million people starved to death. So it was very, very grim. It was a dark place for me to live in creatively for two years. And so when I was done with that book, I was really thinking, okay, I need something a little lighter, please. <laughs> and for many, many years, I had heard about um, these nightclubs and had had people write to me like, oh, you know, my aunt was a dancer there. Or my grandmother was a dancer. Or my grandfather was a singer. Mm-hmm. And so I knew about the performers and I knew about those clubs and I also just personally have a deep, 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 seriously deep <laughs> love of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers oh, films. See. See. And so the idea of kind of coming off of um, the darkness of Dreams of Joy and then knowing, okay, I could live in this, you know, in my, it's a fantasy, right? Um, mm-hmm. In this imaginary sort of Fred Astaire, Chinese Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers film mm-hmm. for a couple of years mm-hmm. really appealed to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just, you know, kind of connected to that is uh, with Shanghai Girls, with all of my books, I try to find people who lived in that era mm-hmm. And there was a sense, it seemed to me, that if I didn't go out and talk to these performers now, I might not get a chance. Right, because they're in their late 80s, 90s 90s. now. Yeah, Yeah. so I interviewed Dorothy Toy, the Chinese Ginger Rogers, when she was 93. She's 97 now. Um, So a lot of people, late 80s, early 90s. The story you tell in this World War II era, in these nightclubs, it's, it's told through three different women who become performers at these nightclubs. The first one we meet, Grace, is... I think if somebody starts the book and they don't realize that she is from a Chinese family, they won't know for a few pages that people are seeing her as the term they use, Oriental. 
But she is an example of something that's very common today, especially in Los Angeles. Somebody who comes from a Chinese family, but for all intents and purposes, sees herself as purely American, as as barely Chinese at all. And this character would have been born. You know, we, we say now these people are in their late eighties, early nineties. Would have been born around nineteen twenty. Is that was that the vanguard of the people who, at the time, would have looked quote unquote Oriental, but behaved one hundred percent American, thought of themselves that way? Were these which would have race been one of the first. Well, you hit on something really important. Um, one of the things that really struck me with these performers is that, especially the women, the majority of them came from the middle of the country. Mm. And their parents left a Chinatown, whether it was San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and went out into the middle of the country where they may have been the only Chinese family for hundreds of square miles. Mm. So these young women grew up um, not seeing any other Chinese apart from their own families. Mm. And they did um, everything that the other little girls did in those towns. You know, they, it's the time of um, Shirley Temple. Everyone wanted to be like Shirley Temple, so they took tap dancing mm. and they were in high school and junior high school plays. I think that they thought that they could do anything. Mm -hmm. And it it really didn't occur to them that they looked different. So many of these people that I interviewed, they would say to me, I did, I I just, I had never seen another Chinese until I went to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. They'd never seen anyone else who looked like themselves. They didn't know they looked different. And in, this, in a way, their parents had already broken the mold. Mm-hmm. So now these young women could break the mold as well. And um, the girls in Chinatown who had been raised there, there was no way they could break that mold. And, you know, again, not allowed to show your arms and legs in public, not even really supposed to walk on the street by yourself. But everything was about um, preparing for marriage and becoming a mother. Mm-hmm. We have another character we hear this story told through, Helen, who has more roots in Chinatown and indeed China, which we find out more about as, as we read from her. But she has, she speaks more traditionally, has more traditional ideas and behavior, and she's always quoting Chinese homilies on various subjects about propriety and whatnot. And it made me think about this, this phenomenon often observed, especially here in Los Angeles, when we have many communities that began, I suppose, as immigrant communities. Now I've had a couple of generations to go on that oftentimes uh, in America, an immigrant community like a Chinatown will be, it will be more conservative than the land itself the people came from. You know, like maybe the Armenian community in Los Angeles, they're more traditional and conservative Armenians than the ones in Armenia right now. It's it's an interesting phenomenon. I wonder if that happens with with Chinese communities, whether they are Chinatowns now or then, that they sort of they, they remain more traditional in a way because they're in America, surrounded by America. If, if that makes sense, I actually think that that's changed quite a bit. Mm. Be, um, but I but I will say this: in my family, so I come from a very large Chinese American family, what I would call a pioneer mm. family, because they my great great grandfather came during the Gold Rush. You know, if you go back in time. Chinese could only live in a Chinatown. There were all of those land laws here in particular here here in California where you could not live outside of Chinatown. You couldn't own property outside of Chinatown until after 1948. They didn't all want to live in Chinatown. They had to live in, they Dine- had to live in Chinatown. Chinatown. Right, exactly. And I think as and you know all the other laws, you know that you couldn't marry outside the race, that you couldn't um, you know, all these extra taxes that they had to pay, uh, you couldn't become a citizen, all of those things meant that you were really within this community. And I think what happens when you are so, uh, I guess what the right would, word would be oppressed, mm-hmm. in a sense, is what do you hang on to? Mm-hmm. You hang on to those traditions and to your culture. Uh, and to your family and your community in a way that you wouldn't if you just came and and got off the boat and (laughs) went out into the middle of the country or, you know, said, I'm going to go move to Texas. Because it just wasn't easy or Mm. even possible to do that back Mm. then. 
I have really seen this myself uh, in in my family. I can remember once this wedding uh, that we had gone to. We were having like a family banquet, but in the other room in the restaurant, they were having a big wedding. Mm. And they were doing all of these other traditions that we did had never even seen. These were new traditions that had come actually from Taiwan. Mm. So here, people had hung on to things so tightly. But in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in mainland China, traditions and culture had continued to evolve. Ah, I see. So they've diverged. Right. Mm. And then one last piece of this is that new immigrants who come today, they've already been so exposed to American culture through television. Right. doesn't matter if you're in a tiny, tiny village in the middle of nowhere in China, you are seeing American television. And so even if you come, I mean, when you come now, it's just completely different. It's not as though you're stepping into an alien land. You are, you're stepping into a place that you've seen in movies and television shows and advertisements and magazines and newspapers. Mm. It does make you wonder, and this is something, I mean, you'll know the answer to this. It makes me wonder what before American movies and American television had got such international reach before American movies and American television, what Chinese people coming to the States and what they thought it was. What was what was this gold mountain to them? Well, I think just that. They <laughs> thought that, really yeah, mountain. literally a gold mountain mm. that you could come here and you would find gold on the street the size mm. of babies and things <laughs> so like that. So the streets that. paved with gold thing was literally interpreted, not literally, literally, but, you know, close enough. Yes, very mm. much so. Mm. And, but I, but also those early people who came, they never had the intention of coming and staying. It, they came as sojourners, people right. who were going to come, make a, make a lot of money. By that, I mean like $1,000. Right. And which in those days. Which in those days was a lot of money. And then go home and then re go retire back into their home villages, and they right. would be able to live very comfortably for the rest of their lives. Mm. It is a phenomenon I see here among... It's, I mean, it's, now it's mostly non-Chinese groups I'm thinking of, perhaps people, families from Latin America or, or Korea. I meet many of them as well, where this, this was the intent. I'm going to go and make money and come back. And for years, they would tell each other, well, we're going to go back next year, next decade, 20 years from now. And they never go back, but they never stop telling themselves they will go back, no matter how many new family members are born here, no matter how many roots they have in America, no matter how alien the old country becomes. Why do they keep saying I mean, does it happen with the Chinese as well? Do they keep saying, we'll go back as sort of a, do they put up their own mirage in that sense? I think in the early days, people really did intend to return mm. for the reasons I said before. But of course, when China closed, 1949, that made that possibility, you know, that just wiped out that possibility. This this is an issue of immigration that I personally find fascinating. That the what pushes people out of a country and what pulls them into a new country, and then that idea of home. And at what point does this become your home? Mm -hmm. um, even though you you keep saying I'm going to go back, I'm going to go back. Even though you keep eating the food that you brought with you from your home country or um, you still follow those traditions and cultural activities, you're still sort of becoming slowly American mm -hmm. and, and adapting yourself into this culture. And yet you can still have that pull that says, oh, I am going to go back. I am going to go back until finally you do realize, oh, you know, I guess this is my home. <laughs> what? You know, we talk about this, the varying Americanization of the characters in this book. We have the fully Americanized Grace and Helen, who is less so. And we have Ruby, who has a different situation. She's not even really from China. Uh, she claims to be, but she's she's had to take matters into her, her own hands a bit. What what actually is Americanization, though? Well, I don't quite understand what you mean. How would you how would you define being Americanized? Because I'm talking about these characters in, in China dolls who have different, I, I'm sure you would agree they're, they're differently Americanized mm -hmm. or have different levels of Americanization. Mm -hmm. But what actually is Americanization in your mind? 
Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't know what that is. Is uh, well, it? Well, you that, created these characters. Well, uh, yes, but is that is it that you think this is your home? You really do think this is your home, and you're never going to go back. Mm. All three of these characters were born here, right. so they are American citizens. Right. But I think they, you know, they do have a different color of their skin. The the rest of America sees them mm. as different, not necessarily as American. Mm. And then even within that, are they Chinese? Are they Japanese? Um, you know, what what do you pretend to be, or what do you want to be? Yeah. Uh, but. I, uh, you know, I, I, if I knew the answer to what makes something someone American, I, I think I could uh, right. rule the world. <laughs> sure, and I think all these characters have different ideas about that themselves. Do you right? They would, if I asked them those questions, they would all say something different about, exactly. positive or negative, right? They'd have different ideas. Exactly, mm -hmm. and and I think if you asked anybody right now today on the street, what what does it mean to be an American? Mm -hmm. You would get every an infinite. Uh, number of answers because I think we all interpret that very differently. You know, some people fly the flag on their front lawn, some people don't, some people um, still follow the traditions of their home country even though they live here. Some people have completely adopted um, American traditions and, you know, love football or whatever, you know, so they're, they're I think they're just different levels and different ways that we express ourselves that's why this is a melting pot mm. <clears throat> or maybe not what is it salad bowl that's the other thing those are the competing metaphors yeah, which yeah. which one do you which one do you see in action more or they, do you see them both happening at once some some are in a melting pot some are in a salad bowl yeah, can't we have soup and salad yes, please I think, <laughs> i've never heard that before but i think yeah i, I think i think we can go with that mm -hmm. from this point onward of course because this is a novel set in the time of world war ii these questions of who is actually an American, who is not actually an American, come to the fore because in wartime you have the, the Japanese become the enemy, and then you have a population uh, who, a, a population, everybody not of Asian ancestry and some who are, now wondering, well, who is Japanese? Mm -hmm. Who is Chinese? What's the difference? Where, do, where does anybody come from? I mean, what... Was it? It sounds like a caricature of the time when I say it that way. But was that really the case when pe people just people Americans of any heritage weren't thinking about who was Chinese and who was Japanese until suddenly the Japanese became the enemy and people just had to start thinking in an entirely new ways about where people were from, what their nationality was. Uh, what they were well, actually you know there was the chinese exclusion act of 1882 right. so they the chinese had been targeted for a very long time they were the right. first asian group to be targeted later there was exclusion against the japanese as well but i think by by the 19 late 1930s 1940s mm -hmm. i think they were sort of seen as just all Asian and probably mostly all Chinese mm. because that was uh, still the largest of the Asian populations here and the one that had had um, so many laws and, and so many restrictions placed on it. So I think it, so when World War II happened, now all of a sudden people had to actually make a distinction. Right, and suddenly as well. And suddenly, yeah, overnight mm -hmm. make a distinction, particularly here on the on the West Coast because we were closer to Pearl Harbor and, you know, the ocean is right there and mm -hmm. they thought the Japanese were going to come any minute now and invade. And, you know, I, I know in my own family um, people in, in Chinatowns along the West Coast, uh, there were organizations that gave out um, armbands, mm -hmm. pins, uh, little placards to put in your car window, uh, in your business, in your house, saying, I'm Chinese, not Japanese. Mm -hmm. And th this was something people had to be very careful about, especially right. at, in those first few months, because um, anybody could be mistaken and, you know, you could be beat up on the street, sure, but you could also be picked up and, and taken away for internment. Mm -hmm. So people really, there really was this sudden moment where, oh, 
we may think they all look alike (laughs) and they're all alike, but they aren't. Mm. And that's why I thought it was so interesting in Time and um, Newsweek, those two articles that I found that came right after Pearl Arbor with diagrams um, side by side showing a Chinese and a Japanese, and then in the just most racist language, (laughs) trying to explain (laughs) what the differences were. Right. It's, It's strange to see materials from that time that do try to identify Chinese people versus Japanese people just through the features of their face, mm-hmm. because you know, I feel like among the circles I'm in now, I'm it's people. Some some are Chinese, some are Japanese, some are Korean, and they will not hesitate to make it known which one they are. But it's not it's not always through the look of their. I mean, it's it's self present. It's self presentation. It's a million different things. The fact that what does it mean that magazines like these would try to reduce it to glancing at somebody's face when that's just, they had to know that wasn't going to work very well, even at the time as a way to separate. They had other things as well. Like you can tell a Japanese by his arrogant attitude (laughs) and his loud, gruff laugh. And, you know, there were, uh, you know, so it wasn't just the physical characteristics, you know, Chinese who up until that point, had been seen as, you know, the kind of person who would eat squirrels and um, was going to pollute our white race and all of that. Now, all of a sudden, they were painted as they're placid, they're kind, they have so much compassion, and you'll be able to tell that person so easily and quickly compared Mm -hmm. to a Japanese who Mm -hmm. would have all of these really um, negative uh, characteristics. Well, of course, Mm -hmm. that's completely bogus, but there it was right there in two of our, you know, most well-known news magazines. Right. It reminds me of this, the sense as well that before they were all assumed to be Chinese by many people going to other countries. I'm sure you've seen this as well. What I, the, the memory that comes back to me is in Mexico a few years ago, I was hanging out with a Japanese friend down there and everywhere she went, she would get called a China. Mm-hmm. Like that's just what they assumed everybody was there still. It wouldn't happen here in California, but there it's, they never, what's, what is the difference between a country that assumes everybody's Chinese and, and one that people, and one where people have sort of had to know that there's a difference? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, look, we live in a racist world or on a, you know, on a racist planet and people make all kinds of assumptions based on how we look. And, um, that's not unique to the United States. It happens all over the world. So I think while you you have just given an example that might be true in Los Angeles, say, or Seattle or San Francisco, where you could say, oh, yes, maybe people could tell the difference. Um, but if you went 100 miles inland, mm. people might have a very different view. And then for like the next 3,000 miles until you get about 100 miles from the, the Atlantic coast. Mm. Um, and I, even that is a very broad statement because they're large Asian communities, you know, they're Hmong and Missoula, for example, right. uh, where I think people would say, oh, yeah, the most interesting places, the Hmong. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that they, that people there probably know, oh, those people are Hmong and, yes. you know, and, and, and we know that they are not actually Filipino, for example. Right, right, right. So I, I don't know that we, we as Americans are beyond those distinctions. Mm-hmm. And in fact, my son uh, showed me this really great website where, you know, you get to take a contest, you see faces, and you yes. try to identify who's who. Right. I failed that thing so miserably. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and that's and like, I have it in the, in yeah, the acknowledgments. The, the all, all look same dot com, right? I saw that in the end of it. But, yeah, that's, again, that's the same thing I was wondering about. Like, yeah, going by just the face, how would you ever know, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm. But, you know, why does it even matter? Right. That's the real question. I mean, right. if you does it matter to me whether uh, I could look at you right now and say, "Well, could be from Sweden or <laughs> Norway or I don't, you know, one of those Scandinavian places." Not as far as I know, unfortunately. But, you know, but you you look like you could have been, but that doesn't that doesn't mean anything to right. I mean, real and and see, and it's not even accurate. So. I don't know that that um, it really 
actually matters mm. in in that in that sense. At the end of at the end of China Dolls, we have a scene in the 1980s with with Grace from the perspective of Grace, who's who's now in her 70s, I suppose, and she she is not confronted by, but she talks. <laughs> she's I suppose she's confronted by uh, her. She's she's confronted by how to put this best for those who haven't read the novel. The the daughter of granddaughter. Her, it's a granddaughter. It's a it's a, of one of her it's a grand yes the grand the, by the I was going to say the daughter of the son of one of her friends, but it's better to say the granddaughter of her friend. That's a little more direct. Um, but she says, you know, we, wow, what was it like to be in a time where there were words like Oriental being used and Grace thinks to herself, well, yeah, it's Orientals and Occidentals. That's what we said. And it's interesting because we, it does seem like most of the people that I've talked to about this subject do consider Oriental to be an obviously unacceptable term because, and they, they always say it's because that's, it's a West centric term. If you say Oriental, then you, you mean they're the other over there in the East. But why did we forget that Occidental was also a term that had currency back then? Mm -hmm. I don't know why we forget that, but I, mm. you know, I had to use those terms mm. in the novel because they were accurate to the time. Mm. And even the title of the book, China Dolls, it is a stereotype. And yet there was a club called the China Doll. They mm. referred to each other as China Dolls. So it was a way to kind of play with some of those um, words that are pretty loaded, but I had to somehow address the fact in there. I could have had it something on, you know, like a little uh, author's note at the very front saying, I don't really use <laughs> Oriental in my personal life, but it's accurate for the novel. Right. But, you know, I still have family that, that use those terms. Right. And I think there are a lot of older people, especially, and the people I was interviewing mm -hmm. who had been performers at that time still right. use all of those terms. So mm -hmm. that does, but that doesn't mean that they, they haven't been criticized for right. it. Right, right. And I, I, I do think, you know, we have, you have to sort of honor the language of the time mm -hmm. that you're writing about or, or have set a novel in and, and yet that doesn't mean we, you know, she can't be confronted a little bit about it at the end. Right. It's, there's also a sense in which we're going to, we, you go enough generations back and we're going to, we're going to find something wrong with what people are saying because we, I mean, we all like to think of ourselves as, as society as, as having advanced in the past few generations, right? So there's, in a sense, we, we do not automatically, but we, we will look skeptically at anything said by people three generations, four generations older, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, you know, and it's not just the language. I mean, there's so many other kinds mm -hmm. of things. Uh, one of the women I interviewed was, her name is Mai Tai Singh. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, what was your favorite gown that you wore when you were performing? Mm -hmm. And she said, it was a, oh, that's so easy. She said, it was a gown made out of 15 yards of monkey fur. 15 yards of monkey fur. Now, just think about how many monkeys have to go into 15 yards of monkey fur. And, you uh, you know, it is so politically incorrect to have a gown made out of 15 yards of monkey fur. <laughs> and yet, and, and that's a detail I never could have made up. I couldn't have. So how do you, you know, I did figure out a way to use it, but I have to use it with our our sensibility today. Mm -hmm. And and yet at the time, I don't think anybody would have blinked at 15 yards of monkey fur. Right. It's, it's, it's fascinating to think about what would not have surprised people, even more so than what surprises us, what didn't surprise them then. In, in that era, I wonder, we talked a bit about the differences now between the Chinatowns of Los Angeles and San Francisco, but in at that time, during World War II, what, how, how were they different? Was it, was it, did they have a similar relationship to the one they have today? Well, San Francisco Chinatown was very different than the one in Los Angeles. San Francisco was a liberty port. So you had so many um, servicemen coming through, whether they were on their way to the Pacific or coming back from the Pacific. Mm -hmm. 
uh, out on Angel Island where the um, immigration station is, there was also this big base that, where they had room for 6,000 soldiers to sit down and have a meal. I mean, you know, this was a lot of young men coming through, coming in and going out. Constant stream of them. Cons- and was never ending there for a few <laughs> years. And and um, also people who had come from all across the country to work um, building ships, building tanks, building trucks, um, a lot of medical personnel because it was the first stop, again, coming back in um, where you had all the um, hospitals for, for wounded soldiers. And, and so the level of activity in San Francisco, that's one reason why these clubs all flourished. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, it was the nightclub era across the country, but those cities that were Liberty Ports that all just took off like crazy mm. and because there was this sense of you don't know what's going to come tomorrow. Mm. And what and what one uh, magazine called, and it, it, and it was a phrase that caught on, es- escapology. <laughs> you know, this sort of phenomenon of people um, wanting to have fun, mm. go out, dance, drink, Find a girl, find a guy, <laughs> and do whatever you can because you don't know, first of all, what's going to happen tomorrow. But but they also were very much following the news. And so nightclub um, attendance would drop down if news from either of the fronts was bad. And then if there had been some kind of a victory, oh, everybody comes out to celebrate again. It would, it would mirror that exactly, the news yeah. from the front. It did. Hmm. Now, what was Los Angeles? And I will just say, we also did have a lot of people coming through Los Angeles as well. Uh, We had the Chinatown Canteen, which was very popular, uh, but it just wasn't at that same level. Mm -hmm. Um, People, of course, shipped out of Los Angeles, but not at the same uh, numbers as they did in, in San Francisco. What was going on in Los Angeles as Chinatown at that time? I mean, there are other, other, other than, well, let's, I'll put it this way, you know, it's, it does seem that, if I, if I have it right, because the, the, the new Chinatowns, the dueling Chinatowns, they were built in 1938, is that correct, around the, the late 1930s? So it was, they were brand new in this time. They, they were essentially probably had, still had the, uh, the new Chinatown look to them. Still, still, it's strange to think of a Chinatown in the popular imagination where it's like, well, things will be old. Things will have old styling as well as be old. But what, what was it? What have you gathered it would have been like to be in a... It's, it's just strange to think of a newly opened Chinatown, right? Mm-hmm. Well, our Los Angeles new Ch- Chinatown, the one that's on Broadway, was the first, and still to this day, was the first and only planned mm-hmm. Chinatown in the United States. And it was planned as a tourist attraction by two white architects yes. who designed it. And it's really just a facade mm-hmm. there. If you go, it, you know, it's just all the, the carvings and roof tiles and uh, neon. That's all just mm-hmm. tacked on the front and all those pretty colors, just paint. Uh, so that, that particular Chinatown was and still is unique in that, in that way. Um, but, I think when, you know, Union State, old Chinatown had been torn down to build Union Station. Now so many people coming through Union Station during the war. Um, this meant that there was this huge influx of people to, in, in, in both Chinatowns into um, restaurants, cafes, bars, nightclubs, curio shops, antique shops, Everything and it was it was a time of great 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 business for everyone, but within the community, this marked some big changes as well. This was the first time that Chinese men, especially, were able to get jobs um, outside of Chinatown. Mm. So, you know, there were already many who had gone to college but couldn't get a job. Now they were hired as engineers. They were hired uh, down here uh, in the um, 
defense and doing all of that defense work, building airplanes and and all of that kind of work, um, and as well as women who sort of became Rosie the Riveters as well. Mm-hmm. But for men, it was really significant because um, even after the war, they were able to maintain their, many of them were able to maintain their jobs. And this just marked a, a change where, oh, I don't have to be a waiter or a dishwasher or a houseboy. Mm. I can actually go out and have a real job out there in the community. Mm. This was, in a sense, then the era where the era where you could see the restrictions were notably lifted. It was it was obvious the direction things were going in terms of well, we're, is America going to let Chinese people join it or not in a in a full way? Uh, I guess the answer was essentially. Yes, at that time, that it was the answer was revealed to be yes. Well, in 1943, um, Madam Chiang Kai-shek came here to raise money for for the war effort, and she uh, testified, addressed Congress. And one of the things that came out of her visit was this renewed push to overturn the Exclusion Act. Mm-hmm. And the reason was, if the U.S. and China are allies, we can no longer treat. Chinese Americans the way that we have. Mm -hmm. So exclusion was overturned. Now, finally, Chinese were allowed to become naturalized citizens. Um, That was a huge change. And then after the war, it still took a while for other laws to to be thrown out. Some of them had to go to the Supreme Court. So here in California, it wasn't until 1948 that um, people uh, less, uh, it was all the way down to a quarter Chinese. So if you were a, before 1948, a quarter Chinese, you could not own property in the mm-hmm. state. You could not marry someone who was non-Chinese in this state. Mm-hmm. Um, the miscegenation laws were in 28 states. And some of those states didn't overturn those laws till 1965. (laughs) So it was a process. And even though the land laws were overturned, that doesn't mean that the covenants that were for certain neighborhoods, even though they were illegal, doesn't mean that they still weren't um, not so subtly enforced. Mm. Because all you have, I mean, I, I have so many people in my own family who would say, oh, you know, we'd see a listing for a house or we'd see a for sale sign and we'd go and we'd knock on the door and they'd say, oh, sorry, this has already been sold. Mm. So even though it hadn't been sold, right? right? Clearly. Or yeah. um, people, um, in again, in my family who would go to a neighborhood and they would say, the people would say, yeah, we'll sell you our house. But then they would go to the, all the neighbors and s- ask, is it okay if we move in? Uh, one by one. Yeah, just one by one, you know, on on our block or on our street. We just want to make sure we're going to be welcome here. And sometimes people said yes, and sometimes people said no. And then you decide, okay, well, I could buy that house, but I'm not going to be very happy here, and my kids might not be safe here. Right. See, these are, these are the norms that are now unthinkable. I don't and, know that that's so. Well, I mean, the norms of saying you'd go around to each house, that, that's the norm I mean, where it's a Chinese family expects to have to go around one by one and ask one by one, is, uh, is it okay if we move here? That's what I mean. It's now hard to imagine. Maybe here in Los Angeles, yeah. but do you think that that would be hard to imagine in a small town somewhere in Oklahoma. I don't know. I'm not picking on Oklahoma. It's a lovely state, but you know, there. I think there are a lot of places where even today, if, if you were, if you were from a different culture, not just China, but just the, you know, that you came, people might not be so willing to have you move into their neighborhood, and there are a lot of ways that people can express that mm. to you. Mm. It's true. It's there's there's that. It's. I can imagine still, of course, to this day, people not being happy about someone different moving into their neighborhood. And I can imagine a family either either avoiding that place or, or, or really just taking the stand, we're going to move in, and they, they, they can like it or not. It's that thing in the middle where they go through that procedure of asking if they can move in. That's what sticks out to me somehow. It's not whether people like it or not. It's It's that... I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it still does happen, but that it doesn't. It doesn't. It seem a. Doesn't it seem like that specific act of asking if it's okay? <laughs> I mean, do, do you, have you heard of that happening these days? 
I haven't heard of it happen. I mean, I, I no, I haven't heard of it happening, but I can completely understand how it could still happen mm. and and would probably be a smart thing to ask. Mm. It's yeah, um, good information to have, probably. Very yeah. good information, and especially you know, like if you have small children or. Um, you know, you travel a lot or whatever, but there, there are a lot of reasons why you want to, I mean, everybody wants to be safe in their home mm -hmm. and everybody wants to feel like they're, that they're accepted in, in their home and in their community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that you, that these people, that's not just your neighbors, but mm -hmm. that they, you know, sort of have your back in a sense uh, in case something happens. So I, I don't know of anybody personally right now that would has done that, but it wouldn't surprise me that it's happening every day all across the country. Mm. Okay, there's and look, I mean, think about New York and what are those co-ops? Yes. I mean, that's exactly what's happening <laughs> for anybody who tries to buy a co-op. Right. Is you're trying to get everybody in that building to say, yeah, we do want you to live in our building. And even right. though you bought this, yes, that doesn't, is. you know, even though you it's a fair and square purchase, we may not let you move in. <laughs> You've got to say more than is it okay. I'm sure there's, it's sure it's, it feels like an endless process to get in one of those. Right, exactly. Mm. It's, yes, it's, it's a way to think about it where that may, uh, going into a New York co-op, they might not be evaluating you on a racial basis, but they could be evaluating you on even tougher ones, even, even ones that are harder to comply with. So it's, it's, I mean, it, it reminds me thinking of, thinking of, how to put it, thinking of the ways that it's, what, the ways that it's still difficult in America today, uh, that we don't always think about clearly. You know, it's, it reminds me of when, when I talk to people who's, people who, of course, because it's America, you go back enough generations, you're going to find somebody who immigrated here. So people whose families have been here a long time, people who have to go back past their great grandparents or whomever to, to find somebody who wasn't born in America, they will often complain a lot about America. And they'll say, well, yeah, why, why would you, why would you want to come to this, this place where every, this, 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 uh, this country where everybody's crass and obese and it's, oh, it's, it's, it's such a police state and so on and so on and so on. But do you get the sense that people do sometimes forget what, what their immigrant forebears were leaving, what they were trying to get away from or what they found in America? I mean, how, 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 how is it? How best to be reminded of that? Well, you know, that's a, I, if I knew the answer to that question, you're asking me some very hard questions today. <laughs> and I think if I knew the answer to some of these questions, I could, you know, be president or something. Uh, but do we forget why America was appealing? Uh, if we if we don't, I don't think so. Mm. I I don't I I don't think so. I think mm. that sometimes the people who are the most, let's just say, belligerent mm -hmm. about being American mm -hmm. are the ones who have not forgotten mm -hmm. uh, or, or really cherish what they think are the best things about America, mm -hmm. you know, and our, you know, and our freedom and, and, right. and, and what that, and how that freedom, how you view that freedom. Um, they may not be terribly tolerant themselves, mm -hmm. but they sure hang on to this idea of um, freedom and uh, for at least for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, look, we are a nation of immigrants. We all had someone in our families who was scared enough, dumb enough, crazy enough to leave their home something country. Enough, yes. Yeah, something enough to leave their home country to come mm -hmm. here. And even those people, if you go back, you know, on my mother's side of the family, we go back to what is like 1640 mm -hmm. is when her family first arrived here. You think that was easy? <laughs> Nothing was easy in 1640. I mean, that had to be real. <laughs> you know, we talk about hardship today, coming right. as an immigrant. Okay, that had to be really hard, really, yes. really hard. And yet people did it, and they had, I think, 
then as now extraordinary courage and had to show extraordinary resilience um, to, and, and persistence to come here and, and actually make a life and, and go through that, well, you know, this transition into becoming American, whatever that, you know, whatever that means to people. You, people do go through a, a transition uh, where they, they, you know, finally do leave that home country behind. Even though, you know, I, I remember once reading this article um, by a, a food anthropologist. And his whole thing was he would go around the country and try different um, Thanksgiving turkey stuffings. <laughs> and that he could tell where people were from based on what they put in their turkey stuffing. I never thought about it. Oh. Yeah, and so it, and it wasn't just like, oh, if you put in oysters, then you must be from Boston. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Do they eat oysters in Boston? It's I don't know. Possible. <laughs> it's possible. Whatever. You, you know, if it has cornbread, you're from the South. Mm -hmm. It was much deeper than that, mm -hmm. um, and it had to do with not just where they were from regionally in the United States, but where... Their, their, you know, their original, and, and even if it had been more than a hundred years, you have to go way back. You have to, but this was such a, a meal. You know, you make it once a year, and it's so traditional. Mm -hmm. And usually, those are recipes that are passed down, you know, down through the generations. Mm -hmm. That how could you possibly have Thanksgiving dinner without having a big platter of lasagna? <laughs> yes, you know, oh, indeed. <laughs> yeah. yes. And I remember going to my first Thanksgiving like that, where they had, you know, was there was the basic turkey and some stuffing, and then everything else was, you know, cannelloni and lasagna <laughs> and caprese salad and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is a, this is a much better Thanksgiving than I'm used to. <laughs> you've, you've written, of course, about times, you know, I'm thinking of this, this date 1640 again, you know, you've written about times that are out of living memory in other novels. And I wonder what, what it was like, how was it different to write about, how was it different for you to write about times that are in living memory, if just barely, and ones that are far out of it? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the big problem with writing about things that are within living memory is that there are people who are alive who can say, you got that wrong. Yes, but you can also ask them what, what it was like. You can, but I remember, I can't remember which, uh, might have been Shanghai Girls, where somebody really got after me because of how I described a pat of butter, <laughs> that they, how they had butter in their cafe during the war and and, but other people had described the pat of butter in a different way. Oh. So, you know, it could have just been two different companies making yeah, the pat awesome. of butter, restaurant butter, you know, fake butter. There wasn't one kind of pat of yeah, butter. Yeah, and I mean, it was fake butter because it was during World War II. Right. Uh, even when I'm writing about the way past, mm -hmm. I try to find first-person accounts. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with Peony and Love, which takes place in the mid-17th century in the Yangtze Delta, I looked for and did find um, first-person accounts. I mean, first, mm -hmm. there were all of the things that people had just written, stories, poems, wow. letters. But I also found a whole book uh, that really was a collection of material from uh, the what was called the Ming Qing transition. And one of those was an essay that had been written by a man who had um, survived when when the soldiers came into uh, Yang Yangzhou, mm -hmm. and how they you know his family had climbed up on the roof and they'd hidden had gone gone into where the barn was and had slithered under the the bellies of the mm -hmm. you know all the animals there and they'd hidden in these stacks of. Um, straw and how his wife sacrificed herself so that everybody else could live. I read that and oh, he was just so obnoxious, this guy. <laughs> really? You know, oh, yeah. They were up on the roof in the rain and then the concubines, it was raining so that then the concubines, their tops all got wet. Sure. And so then he's like, you know, it was like sort of a wet t-shirt contest <laughs> up there on the roof. And I'm thinking, okay, your wife is about to be murdered, you know, and right. slashed to death and raped and killed. And, and he's focused on his concubines' wet breasts. But sure. 
uh, when I got to the end, oh, and he had said to his wife, um, my mouth wants to go on eating for a while. You know what to do. <laughs> I read that and I just thought, you know, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was really my reaction. <laughs> what? And really what that says about the time, but the difference in our in cultures and, you know, the idea that, to, you know, it's always women and children first, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it should be. I'm say. a woman. <laughs> it better be, but not then and not there. Right. And so I, I wrote, I actually ended up using all of that mm -hmm. material, but writing it from her perspective. Mm -hmm. So you can find things out there. However, if I'd made a mistake in there, maybe I did. Mm -hmm. She wasn't there to say, hey, you know, right. that's not the way the, I wore my hair. Nobody's right? going to do the pat of butter thing They're in that era. I'm not going to do the pat of butter thing, though. No. <laughs> what, what are your first memories? What were your first interactions? What were your first interactions with Chinatown here in Los Angeles? Well, I, I lived with my mother, and we lived all over L.A., but mostly in Topanga. And, but my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles ha had the family antique store, which was... Um, when I, you know, it started in 18, in the 1870s up in Sacramento and then moved down to Los Angeles is still in business today. But when I was little, they were on Ord Street. Um, and it was in the last remaining building of, of China City. So there'd been the fire and, and, you know, it never reopened. And so I spent a lot of time in that last building. And I've kind of come to look at that as like the skeleton of, of China City. It was mm -hmm. quite large. It had a big central aisle. And along the sides were these little rooms um, that once had been shops in China City. But now, you know, if you were going on the left side, it was the uh, bronze room, the art room, ceramics. And then coming back on the other side, um, textiles, scrolls, jewelry. Mm -hmm. But there were also these other kind of forgotten rooms and nooks and crannies that had things like the old China City Wishing Well, the old China City Goldfish Pond. This place was such an incredible place to me. And my grandfather and I would walk up to uh, Spring Street and pick up what we then called uh, Cheng Na, Hao, which is now what they call dim sum. Mm. Um, but but uh, we would go in there and, and bring stuff back to the store, and my grandmother would take me to the international grocery where we'd sit and chat with Margaret, who ran it. And This was a place that meant so much to me. And my mom and I, like I said, we moved a lot, but the one thing that was permanent was the store, mm. was that little neighborhood. And this right. wasn't in the new Chinatown. It's the, what would be called the Spring Street Chinatown. Mm. So I don't know. Today there isn't a single brick left of that. You know, it's just literally been wiped off the physical map. Mm. And I feel like a lot of what I do um, as a writer is try to go and find people who lived in these extraordinary times and some of them who did really extraordinary things. We haven't really talked much about the performers themselves, right. but how, you know, and, and to try to capture those stories before those people pass on, you know, and those stories are lost forever. It sounds like you had quite a good time hearing their stories too. When you could get firsthand, it sounds like they, they had pretty sharp memories of these of these high times, right? Mm -hmm. They were, mm. they are very sharp, mm. and uh, I also talked to the some children too, oh. you know, who had grown up backstage, and and traveling on the chop suey circuit in the back seat. So they mm -hmm. they also saw all kinds yes. of of things, uh, but these you know these were people who really broke the mold, who had a desire to be a performer. Mm when the odds of actually being able to do it or being allowed to do it were so slim, mm. um, but they loved it so much they still had to do it. And some of them, like Dorothy Toy, who was the Chinese Ginger Rogers, she traveled all over the world, you know, and was quite, mm. quite well known. She happened to be Japanese, right. um, but... Well, like but, the character in your book. Right, yes. like the character in the book, but uh, she you know, 
I think she had an extraordinary and very long career, even though she's not a household name. I mean, even though she isn't Ginger Rogers. <laughs> With the, the fact that we have these three characters, that we have Grace and Helen and Ruby telling the story, I mean, it tells me that this was a world where you, you really do need at least three different perspectives to be describing it because there was, you, know, you say to somebody, there was this world of Chinese nightclubs in, in wartime America, and you, somebody might think that's a very specific thing, but it sounds like the... There is a vastness of experience within that. And it seems to me, Demi, did it seem to you writing this that you do need at least three, you need at least three protagonists to, to give a sense of how varied somebody's experience could be mm -hmm. as, as a performer. Is that, is that true? Yes, that's absolutely true. I, I, you know, earlier at the very beginning, I was saying how, um, the, really the majority of the women performers did come from the Midwest, mm -hmm. that they were breaking the mold that way. They had family that had already broken the mold. They'd grown up thinking that they could be and do whatever they wanted. Um, really, you know, Helen really is made up. There was no one that I found that actually grew up in Chinatown. So I thought it would be really interesting yeah. to see what would the circumstances have to be for yeah. someone to act, a, a young woman who'd grown up in a proper Chinese family in Chinatown, what would the circumstances have to be for her to be allowed to dance? And then I was very inspired, not just by Dorothy Toy and her story, but I also met another woman um, uh, who had been, was not a performer, had been sent to Topaz and just started a letter writing campaign to get out. And why she did, she loved all the sort of movie magazines and gossip magazines and mm -hmm. gossip columns. And so she wrote to all of those people who had columns. Mm -hmm. And so will you please just help me get out? Right. And one of them, Lee Mortimer, who worked for the New York Daily News, did sponsor her to mm -hmm. get out of Topaz. He brought her to New York, and she was one of the eight original dancers at the China Doll. She'd mm -hmm. never had a dance lesson. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then she ended up being a performer for the rest of her life, or, mm -hmm. you know, the, for a long, the length of her career right. until she had children. And mm -hmm. I mean, even when she had children, they were traveling with with her. So uh, I, I think to, to take that, and again, it's sort of a way of looking at race and racism and looking at what happened to the to Japanese Americans in a very different kind of way. I mean, we know, well, in a lot of places, people don't actually know about internment. It always surprises me. Mm -hmm. um, it was, but it was such a part of what happened here in the West that mm -hmm. I think we're pretty familiar with it here. Um, but there were people who were able to get out and who did go and do these sort of interesting things. There's the, um, uh, I'm only remembering his Japanese name, Goro Suzuki, right. who um, was a comedian in San Francisco and was sent to an internment camp and then was later released to go out and kind of be on the comedy circuit and play comedy clubs and Later in life, he was on Barney Miller. So, uh, Jack Sue, sorry, yes. Jack Sue. Yes. And again, with the Chinese name. So, mm -hmm. I thought that that was really interesting to see mm -hmm. uh, and to explore this kind of different aspect of um, internment and the Japanese American experience of, mm -hmm. of people who are, choose to. Um, sort of try to pass as Chinese American instead of as Japanese American. Right. It's it is in a way as well one more. It's a continuation the way that these Japanese Americans try to pass as Chinese. It's a continuation of the the way in your novels one can read about uh, China's China's interact is interaction the right word with the outside world the relationship china and the rest of the world have I mean, would you say your interest as a novelist is is in china purely is in china is in how china interacts with the world is in is in the, the experience of of women who uh, who are, are tied up with china somehow what what would you put it I, can I have have a little of all of those? Yes, you, you absolutely <laughs> yeah. can have a little of all of those. And what am I missing? That's what I'm going to ask you. I, I think 
Um, well, I guess the one piece that I would say was missing was just the actual history mm. of particular uh, times or movements. Um, I mentioned earlier Peony and Love, mm. which was about these young uh, women writers in the Yangtze Delta, more women mm. writers there than who are being published, mm. traveling around the world, the country on book tour, 17th century mm. version <laughs> of book tours, than there were in all of the rest of the world at that time. Mm. Well, of course, there weren't very many women in writers in the rest of the world right. at that time. I think we'd be hard-pressed to come up with the names of five. Mm. But in this one small area, there were over a thousand women writers mm. who were being published. And you could go into a bookstore today and buy a collection of Chinese poetry, and you will see their works in print. Mm. So to me, this is just extraordinary. It's a piece mm. of not only uh, literary history, but women's history that mm. to me seems has been kind of lost, forgotten, some ways even kind of deliberately covered up. So um, to be able to go and, and write a novel about that and do the research for it, I just think is really, um, it's, it's like a passion that I have to find those stories. Mm. And and then you just put the people in them and, <laughs> and hijinks ensue. <laughs> <laughs> I've been speaking here with novelist Lisa C., whose books are at the intersection of Chinese history, Americans' history, women's history. The new book is China Dolls. Lisa, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the LARB at losangelesreviewofbooks.com or with me at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. <laughs>